Good evening and welcome to this week's episode of QTV. We've got another great lineup of segments for you this evening. chatting with electrical apprentice Patsy Clark, who's joined the push for more women tradies. We continue our glimpses into Asia series, looking at the ongoing morality backlash in Malaysia and the long-running gay bar that defies the trend. North Richmond Dr Nico Clark talks about the challenges and success of the new safe injecting room. And we delve into the past, look at the rise of the pink dollar in the 90s when mainstream business embraced the Q plus community. normal tools and then the decision for me to go into this kind of work has definitely been the best decision I've ever made I wish I could have done it earlier if, if the avenue had been there for me I definitely think I prefer being on construction I like being able to see the th things that I've worked on and at the end of the day I can go oh yeah I did that I had a pretty good childhood I was born in a small town called Greenock in Scotland did most things that I guess kids in Scotland do, <laughs> although there's not much to do since it rains quite a bit. But um, I was right into um, football, soccer, um, as a kid. And yeah, and my friends around me, we all kind of liked the same things. We were all tomboys. We all, you know, played out in the street, I guess, because you could in those days. Dad, he worked for the electricity board, actually. He was a forklift driver um, at the electricity company in Scotland. Um, and mum was a home help. So she looked after um, the elderly in their own homes. She did that part-time while I was growing up, sort of thing, yeah. My mum always wanted me to be wearing dresses and she always had me dressed up every time we went out, but I was more comfortable in jeans and trousers and just getting dirty, you know, the, the, yeah, jeans and t-shirt, that was my kind of style <laughs> as a kid. You know, you were always told, oh, if you like that girl, it's just because you want to be them, like you admire them, you want to be them. So I just kind of had that in my, my mind that, you know, I'm not sexually attracted to them, I must be just wanting to be like them. Um, and it took me until I was like 17 or 18 to actually figure out that that wasn't the case, like I actually was sexually attracted to girls. Um, so that was kind of hard, it was hard to come by. I grew up Catholic as well, so there was, all, uh, there was that stipulation and that's probably one of the reasons why I never figured it out sooner. I had got into a relationship with a girl I worked with um, and it just clicked. I just knew that it felt right. <clears throat> and then, but I kept that whole relationship secret for three years. My aunt was probably the hardest to, to tell because she was my mum's sister and she was very, very Catholic and very devout. And I figured, you know, if I'm going to lose anybody out of anyone, it was going to be her. And she took it, she was amazing because I think I played it the right way because I told her that I was gay and moving to Australia at the same time. So she was more upset that she was losing me rather than me being gay. So yeah, that worked out. <laughs> and then I moved to Melbourne um, and I started working at the Melbourne Aquarium in the retail shop there. And then that's when I met my current partner. So we became really, really good friends. And, and so we're sitting drinking one night and had this conversation and we both decided that's it let's do we're pre-apprenticeships and let's get this ball started so that's how that started at the moment i'm working for a company um that isn't a union-based company um and i've been finished my apprenticeship for eight weeks and i'm still finding it i'm finding it very hard to find a job and i think it could still be the gender gender um issue i can show you my toolbox yeah it's my favourite drill, if you want to a picture of my favourite drill. So I've joined the Electrical Trade Union, or the ETU. 
my employer at the time, the, the group training organisation that I joined up, signed up my apprenticeship with, they pretty much said you have to be on union because every site that we send you to will be union sites. Other sites, you know, if you're not in the union, you don't have those little extras. You don't have a female toilet and, you know, you don't even have a lunchroom sometimes, you know, to heat up food. So it's definitely worth it to be in the union. The toilets are always an issue, but uh, there's definitely been girls who have had issues with um, some of the guys making sexual comments or sexual harassment, but I've been pretty lucky, so. Being short, I have to take 10 foot ladders with me. So I've learned how to carry them to the best of my ability and my height. And you get the odd guy who'll be like, oh, I'll give you a hand with that love. And then, um, you know, and I'll just say, no, sorry, I've got it. You know, I'm fine. I have to do it every single day. You're not going to be with me every single day to carry my ladders for me or that drum of cable that's pretty heavy. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with the, the fact that I got taught that right from the get-go because it's made me realise that I can do it and I don't need a guy to help me. And then all my power tools are... That's all my power tools in there. I don't know if you can see in there though. You definitely feel that you get respect when you do it yourself and if you don't need that hand and I think that that's what we as girls have to do. We have to prove that we can do the same as a guy and, and we don't need their help for every little thing that we do and if you can stand up and say, yep, I can do this, then you can do it. There was a women's committee that had started but there wasn't enough members or enough girls who wanted to participate. And I put my hand up straight away because I do want to see the changes that being a plumber or being a carpenter or being a sparky is something that they can achieve straight from school. You know, instead of being 36 and just figuring out that this is where you want to be in life. The girls who get pregnant and they, they, they need maternity wear, we're, we're working on this at the moment to make sure that this is something that's available to women who get pregnant. And that just, your PPE fits properly, you know, the, the clothes that you wear fit properly so that you don't have to wear the guy stuff that's too tight or you have to buy the baggier stuff that gets caught on machinery or, you know, just gets um, caught in everyday life. I can't get gloves to fit these small hands. So that's, that's a big challenge for me is just um, getting PPE that, that fits and making um, employers understand that just because we're female, we aren't all going to go off and get pregnant or employers don't want to hire women because they think the next thing that they're going to do is take time off for um, having babies and they don't want to pay maternity leave and they don't want to have to um, supply maternity wear for women. That's our campaigns at the moment, is just to get the mindset changed. So it's kind of good to, to be that change that's, that's coming through. It's quite rewarding. Coming up now, we take a look at the story of the Blue Boy Bar in Kuala Lumpur that lives on despite many police raids. Blue has been here in Kuala Lumpur for the past 39 years. I can 
say the biggest ring ever, where they have about seven authorities. <laughs> Malaysia, even is a multiracial, multi diversity country, but the main religion is still Islam. Yes, of course, it's against uh, the religion of having two same gender being together. <laughs> They will come here once in a while to check on the licensings, on, on everything. When they don't have anything else to talk, they will pick on us, the LGBT. But the rest of it, we are fine. I've been cheated by you since I don't know where. So I've made up my mind, it must come to an end. I am fine here in Kuala Lumpur, being as a drag performer, I have no problem here. Will I ever live? I don't know how, but I suddenly lose control. There's a fire within my soul. Just one look and I can hear the rain. One more look and I forget everything. Oh, oh. Coming up next is North Richmond Community Health Centre Dr. Nico Clark, who spoke on Joy 94.9's Saturday Magazine with Macker and Taz. Then we'll dive into the past and look at the rise of the pink dollar. What else happens in the injecting rooms? I mean, it's basically a healthcare facility. It's a, in an innovative means of delivering healthcare to a, a marginalised group of people who are otherwise not receiving it. And one component of that is kind of providing a place in which people can inject and reviving them if necessary but it's only it's only one component and the, the, it's the relationships that they build with the staff members the capacity to to be vaccinated against diseases treated for their hepatitis to be linked in with drug dependence treatment mental health care homeless services the whole range of things that 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 population needs is really what the center is about and that's ultimately what will deliver the biggest lasting benefit in many ways because fatal overdoses are quite rare. I'm assuming there's a fair amount of international research on the veracity of the injecting rooms. Uh, are we currently running a study on Australian rooms? So the, the room in Sydney has been running for 20 years um, and that coincided with a reduction of, of heroin use in the, in the area, a reduction in heroin overdoses in the area and ambulance call-outs. 
but that to some extent there was also there was a kind of reduction in heroin use in Australia at the time because of the situation in Afghanistan there was a drought and there was a drop in production so it makes it a little bit complicated to evaluate but you do see in overdose rooms more of a reduction in the hours when when the room is open more of a reduction in the immediate vicinity of the rooms than you see elsewhere so from that we can we can estimate that they do reduce a number of overdose deaths uh, but just as importantly they they are a pathway into healthcare resources that people need in you know 20 years ago it was hiv and now it's uh, hepatitis and and drug treatment and other services these other health interventions they're actually quite essential to the health of these people and also in terms of public health aren't they i was um just this week I, th I think one of my staff was telling me she that somebody was registering to use the facility and we ask people we invite them it's an optional thing to tell us a little bit about their their situation and and we ask people when they start how long they've been using heroin and on average they're 40 and have been using heroin for 20 years and he said what do you mean when did i start injecting or, or you know my father started injecting me when i was six wow and you know that's you know we we hear story after story of the most horrific ab abusive situations you can imagine and i think you know we've been told a, uh, a story that people who use drugs are bad that it's entirely their choice and that they just need to kind of behave themselves and we just need to kind of be a little bit strict with them as a little bit like you know maybe uh, we imagine uh, kind of uh, children if they're kind of not doing quite behaving quite the way they normally are <laughs> but I think if we ask ourselves how do we want to treat those people yeah. in our society who have had the most horrible challenging initiation to life what do you say nico to the moral panic that certain certain sections of the media like to promote in terms of the increased crime rate in the area uh, you know, people sort of overdosing out in the street. I don't think anybody calculated accurately how many public injections were taking place in Richmond. I don't think we even have good data on how many people are injecting drugs in Richmond, but certainly my experience is that there's less of people injecting and overdosing around the facility that, than there were before, but that's just one person's observation. But I think the essence of, of the moral panic as you, as you talk about it is it's not so much based on any kind of any good perception of whether the situation is better or worse than before but a kind of frustration that it's there at all you know why am i living in an area with lots of people who use drugs why are they why are they here why am i not living in a society where like many other parts of melbourne where people you know we walk down the street and we, people smile at each other and I, and I, I think it's quite confronting to see people who, and and they do give that, you know, there is the impression, many people in Richmond, that, that gives the impression that they don't adhere to the same social norms that, that some other people do. And many of them have been in prison. Many of them have had extremely negative interactions with the kind of uh, the aspects of their society. And they, they do give off an era that they're not necessarily going to respond in a way that you might predict I think we do need to deal with the fact that it, it is difficult for people to live in close proximity to somebody who who comes from a completely different way of seeing things and there there's as a society we have to think well how do we bridge this gap somehow we saw uh, Martin Foley the Minister for Mental Health also for Equality and Creative Industry he said during the week you know commenting on the extended hours and the additional security uh, an increased police presence in the area and some more outreach workers that we've taken action to keep people who use drugs safe from overdose and we're turning our attention to cleaning up the streets of North Richmond. What, what people say if they are seen injecting in the streets, they typically say, well, I went to the room and it was full. Right. And it, it has been running close to capacity for, for a number of months now. And so there is um, uh, a perception that perhaps if we're now at this larger facility and we've already seen significant increase in numbers of people coming to the facility, you know, perhaps we'll be able to provide a space for everybody mm. so that people won't, they'll no longer have that experience. As a society, you draw certain lines and you say, well, if somebody crosses that line, then, you know, we have a response. But I think there's, you know, when I talk to the police, when I talk to, there's there's a consensus that for the vast majority of the, of, of the, 
people in Richmond that the, the most effective response is a health response. Yeah. And that what we should be doing is to, to maximise the both our law enforcement and our health resources to encourage people to go into to receive the health care they need. And that will give us the best safety outcomes. We're used today to businesses, big and small, especially big, being interested in supporting LGBTI rights, in marketing to us, and using us to signal their respect for diversity, which is such a part of Australian society. A gay male couple worrying about hair loss, or drag queens on their way to broken heel, breaking down and calling on a car insurer. These are part of our everyday life now. But of course it wasn't always like that. Once upon a time, any connection with homosexuality was enough to send companies scurrying for cover. The real breakthrough moment came in 1992, when Toyota, rather than just putting an ad for their cars in the press, decided to design ads including gay people, targeted at gay people. There were two ads, one for the sports model of the car, which included two young spunks draped over each other, the other the family model, a gay male couple a picnic basket and their Dalmatian. It created a sensation. It was widely noted and provided a model for other companies to follow suit. Telstra in particular took this up and started to use gay imagery in gay publications and on bus shelters in places like King's Cross and Oxford Street. There were two dykes on a bike. There were two gay men jogging, flirting with the Telstra technician. But most dramatically, perhaps, was the Miss Candy series of ads, which began, first of all, with her holding up a Telstra prepaid card, but moved on to Miss Candy emerging from a pond, the big pond, as it were, holding a fish in her mouth. In this ad, Telstra were parodying their own advertising in order to appeal to this new gay and lesbian market. The use of Miss Candy was significant. She was certainly one of the most popular and well-known Melbourne drag queens. She had begun her performing life in the late 1970s at Queen's Birthday Picnics, which were small, rather secretive community events. But as the scene grew and grew over the course of the 80s, she became more and more visible, more and more known, more and more loved. During the golden age of the gays, Miss Candy was appearing everywhere. Yeah, in all of the major venues and many of the minor ones, working alone and with other drag queens. She was wildly flamboyant. At six foot four inches tall, she said, you can't take yourself too seriously. Nor could you buy clothes off the rack. Everything she wore was custom made. Behind Miss Candy, or perhaps buried deep inside, was Ron, a boy from Warrnambool. Much quieter, much more conservative. And the two of them coexisted and still coexist happily together. That was a great step forward in the 1990s and just shows how valuable the pink dollar is. A great transformation step forward. Absolutely. And also I think the women tradies, it's come such a long way because it started in the 90s and now I think everybody knows a woman tradie and actually love them in their home. As long as they do a good job, who cares? Of course. Well that's all from us on QTV this evening. Join us again next week for our next episode. Have a nice evening. Thinking